Oh, good morning, Mary and Shine. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that's where we're going to be here today, so if you got your Bible, you can bust it out. Um, it's also going to be up on the screen here when we finally get to our passage, but I wanted to tell you guys today about 2 Corinthians chapter 5, because it's a beautiful chapter on what we are supposed to be doing while we're here on this earth. The chapter begins by describing that one day, our earthly bodies will die will be raised from the dead to an eternal body to dwell with God. This is the hope and promise given to us by Jesus, right? And perhaps the most well-known passage of the Bible is John 3.16. This is the NLT version, so it might sound a little bit different. But it says, for this is how God loved loved the world. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. This is our ultimate hope in the hopelessness of a sinful creation. A creation that cannot get itself out of sin. This is the gospel message, church. And then 2 Corinthians 5 goes on. It reminds us that while we're still here on this earth, guess what? We're still living in earthly bodies, right? Sometimes those earthly bodies function well. A lot of times they don't, right? And what should we do while we wait for those heavenly bodies? Those eternal bodies, Paul begins to ponder in 2 Corinthians. Should we just relax? Should we just kick our feet up, try to get as comfortable as possible and wait for that eternal day? We got Jesus. We're free from sin. Let's stop with all the rules and regulations and just have a good time, right? Check out of this earth. No, Paul says, our goal still remains the same, to please God. And what pleases God while we're here on this earth? What did Jesus tell us to do in our earthly bodies? Paul says, we work hard to persuade others. He says, Christ's love directs us. Our old life of selfishness and focusing on ourselves is gone. Our new life of loving others, of persuading them of the good news of Jesus Christ has come. This is what we are to do with our earthly bodies until the day we are called home. Do you guys remember last week when we spoke about legacy, right? Legacy being that impact that you leave on people. Every interaction you have with someone else leaves a legacy with them. Now, usually we hear about legacy at funerals, right? Not to get too down on Sunday morning, bear with me here, but we usually hear it about funerals, right? As people share the legacy that person had on their life. Hopefully it's good stuff, sometimes it's stuff that requires a little therapy, but you know, that's life, right? And people in their twilight years can contemplate their legacy, right? What did I do with my life? How will I be remembered? What impact did I have on this world? What did I do with my earthly body? Was it worth it? Did I make a difference? And last week we said, even if you're young, you should start building a legacy, but not a legacy for yourself. We said to build a legacy for Jesus, to continue his legacy by inviting and showing people the gospel to help them know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Paul says a similar thing. He says, we should be pleasing to God by persuading others of this hope we have to share the gospel, to love others, so that when you receive your new eternal body, you will have done what Christ asked you to do, reconciling others to know Jesus, and you will see the fruits of that legacy when you see the people that you impacted here on this earth in their heavenly bodies. This is the legacy that we should be continuing in this world. And so Paul ends 2 Corinthians chapter 5 with verses 17 to 21, and that's what we're going to read this for our text this morning. It'll be up on the screen, or you could follow along in your own Bible as well. It says this, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, The old life, the way you used to live, the important things to you is gone. A new life has begun, one where you work to please the Lord and spread the gospel. And he says, all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. You might not know it, but spreading the gospel is actually a gift for you guys. 
You know, like it's a gift that you get to go out and tell other people and be involved in their lives and show them the love of Jesus. We'll get back to that, right? And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gospel message, for the beautiful love that you show us, and the things that you've called us to here on this earth that please you. Father, we pray that you would open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to your message this morning on how we can share the gospel well, how we can be part of Jesus's legacy in telling others about the beautiful work that you have done through Jesus. Father, so that we can build up Jesus's legacy here on this earth and be with more family when the eternal bodies come. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this past summer, we've been having a lot of smoke where we live. You guys been outside for this? Seen it on the news, I assume, right? Um, You might remember scenes like this of downtown Minneapolis, right? Where it's just smoke-covered haze, right? I couldn't get a picture of Hastings online. I don't know if it was because it was too smoky around here when you all took your pictures or not, but, you know, whatever. So we had all these low-quality air alerts, right, that you'd be driving or you'd see on your phone. Now, this was primarily due to Canadian wildfires this year, and they were exceptionally bad this year. On June 6, the Weather Channel had this graphic of active wildfires in Canada. And just yesterday, August 19th, ABC News was reporting on the current acreage that is burned in Canada. And you can see in this graphic that it is by far the worst fire season since 1980. Right? The stuff going on up there is crazy bad this year. And it's even not over yet as the British Columbia province just declared another emergency and evacuated another 15,000 homes. And several of those large fires are still not contained. Church, our prayers go out to our neighbors to the north as they continue to battle these, right? And we definitely pray for God to release more rainfall so that these fires can be contained sooner rather than later. Now, as I was thinking about the message for today, and as these wildfires came to mind, it also reminded me of a few months back when we learned about Jesus' words in Luke chapter 12, verse 49. And he says, I have come to set the world on fire, and I wish it were already burning. Now, Jesus was not talking about literal fire in Canada, if you'll recall that message, right? But he was talking about the refining fire in our lives that changes and transforms us, purifies us, the fire of the gospel. And he was also talking about how the gospel will spread and how the fire of the Holy Spirit would go out. As we see in Acts 2, literal tongues of flame come from heaven to rest on God's people. And this fire analogy was really on my mind as I was thinking, how should we spread the gospel, right? How we are ambassadors to this world. How we try to take the spark, the fire that Jesus started, and spread it across the world. And these things got me thinking, and it's really very simple, right? A fire spreads when conditions are right for it to spread. A fire spreads when the conditions are right for it to spread. Something starts the fire, and then if things around that are dry and combustible and ready to be burned, the conditions are right for it to be spread. In our Canadian wildfires, lightning storms went through, and because the forest was dry from a lack of rain, the fire spread quickly. If the forests were soaked from rain, the lightning strikes would not have caused massive fires. The conditions were right. The gospel is the same. Jesus started a fire when he died on the cross and told us to spread it. 
and it needs good conditions to spread well. It's probably why you will see me not standing on a street corner. Let me say that again, because that was just terrible grammar. <laughs> Let me just read what I wrote. It's why you probably won't see me standing on a street corner yelling at people to be saved or print out tracks for you to put on people's car windows. I don't think those are the right conditions for the gospel to spread. Today, we're going to talk about good conditions to spread the gospel. And it starts with one key thing. And guess what, church? It's not about the people around you. It's about you. We ask this question, is my fire burning bright? Is my fire burning bright? Is it hot enough and bright enough to spread, or is it a weak fire that won't spread? You see, church, not all fires are created equal. Take, for instance, these two items, a tea light. I got a picture for you of a tea light flame, right? Small, delicate, you put this in your room when you want some meditative quiet time on the couch, right? Or we have this beautiful monstrosity, which is a propane torch. <laughs> yeah. Corey saw this picture and he was like, I got one of those at home. Anyone else have one of those at home? Yeah, we got a few over here. Cool. I apologize to all of those of you out there whose spouses will be going home today to order one. I actually like this graphic of this propane torch because it's just a torch you hook up to a propane tank. And my, uh, we were actually sitting around for dinner as a family. We had the window open last summer. And we heard what sounded like a jet engine going off in our backyard. So I peeked my head out. And my neighbors got one of these lighting a bonfire in his backyard. And I'm just like, I want one. <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, just a little pastoral advice here, though. If you see that graphic very closely, um, underneath propane torch, it says, I think it's supposed to be 50,000 BTU, but it actually says five zero comma, and then it's got four zeros following it. Um, just a bit of pastoral advice. If you're going to purchase something that may or may not end your life in a fireball, try to purchase it from a company that checks the details a little better, right? <laughs> I don't want to have to visit any of you in the hospital because you wanted to save five bucks on Amazon for your blowtorch. But back to the question, which one of these two is more likely to spread a fire? A tea light or a torch? And of course we say the propane torch because spreading the gospel is the same way. Is the gospel alive and fiery in your life? Does your life reflect that fire in your heart? Or does your heart reflect that of a tea light? Is the gospel something you think about when you wake up and when you go to sleep? Is it something that burns inside of you to share with others? Is it the most important task in your life to do, as the Bible tells us it should be? Is the gospel fiery within you? Look, church, if the only reason you want to invite people to know Jesus is because the pastor told you to, we got a problem. But if you're inviting people because you feel the burn of God's love within you and you need to share that, that is the first right condition for spreading the gospel. Look at it this way. Say you went out to the recent Barbenheim, Barbenheimer phenomenon. Uh, Kristen and I did this a few weeks ago, right? Where you see Barbie and then you go see Oppenheimer movie in the theater back to back. A lot of people dressed up in pink for Barbie. I'm not going to say whether we did or not. But most, both movies were really good, right? In their own ways. But let's say I got done with the movies and I come to church the next day and one of my friends asks me, hey, how are the movies? And I say, eh, they were okay, right? Um, is my friend going to want to dress up and go see them? Are they going to dress up in pink and get all excited? No, because if it wasn't important to me, it's not going to be important to them. Church, same with the gospel. If those around you don't see it as a fire in your life, and you try telling them about the gospel or try inviting them to church, like, hey, my church is kind of cool, I guess, and the pastor said I had to bring someone, so do you want to come, right? <laughs> They're probably going to be pretty skeptical about it. They're going to judge its importance for their life by how important it is for you. Church, if you want to spread the gospel, it must first be evident in your life. 
For Jesus, when he did his ministry on this earth 2,000 years ago, what we see in the narrative is that God's power went before him. That is, his actions would show God's power long before he started telling people about eternal life, about following him, about his commands. He demonstrated to them that this thing was powerful. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. The Spirit of God showed up long before he started talking. Church, he was not just talking about the kingdom of God. He was living out the kingdom of God. The power of the gospel needs to go before you. Before you ever start talking about it, people need to see the power of Jesus in you and how it has affected your life. And if they can't see it, you're just going to be speaking empty words. The way they will see it is how you live your life, how important following Jesus is, how Jesus has changed your life, how the Holy Spirit leads you and guides you to live a transformed life full of mercy, grace, love, and truth. This is the power of the gospel that people will see before you ever speak to them. Church, is your fire burning bright? This is the first condition for spreading the gospel. It precedes you, and it's the condition that must be there before we ever talk about how to tell your friends. So let's talk about how to tell your friends, right? I got three conditions for you. First, I want you to pray for your three. Pray for your three. When we talk about inviting people to know more about Jesus or to come to church with you, we're not asking you to just do it once a year in the fall when the pastor reminds you. No, I want this to always be a part of our lives, right? Something we are always looking for the opportunity to do. And church, this begins with prayer. All of you should have received a yellow piece of paper with three lines on it. It's activity time, craft time, yay? Yay? All right, make sure you got your little piece of paper with the three lines on it, right? Um, this is nothing fancy, but here's what I want you to do with this. On your paper, I just want you to write down and think about the names of three people in your life who you might want to share the gospel with, who you might want to invite with church, who you might want to have a lunch with and talk about God with. Nothing fancy, and what I'd like you to do now is I'm actually going to give you a minute or two to go ahead and take some time, think of those three names, and uh, write those down there. All right. Oh. <laughs> All right. Feel free to keep reading. Um, what I want you to do with this little piece of paper is I made it big enough or rather small enough that if you're a dude, it can fit in your wallet. Um, ladies, I don't know where, what your purse holds. I try not to know, like, all the little pockets and places. So I hope it can go somewhere where you can, you know, see it all the time and stuff like that. But put it in your wallet or purse, right? And what I want you to do is every single time you see it, every single time that you think about spreading the gospel, I just want you to pray for these three names, right? Church, this is not a hit list of people that you got to get in the church or else, okay? I want us to be genuine in this, right? This is just a group of people that you feel is on your heart to develop a relationship with, and that begins with praying for them. And if the Holy Spirit leads you to one day have a conversation with them about faith in Jesus, this is part of the power that goes before you when you look to spread the gospel, right? So I want you to be praying for these three. Now, when I pray for my list of people in my wallet, I pray for two things in particular. One is, I pray that God would show his power to them, right? I think these people that I'm praying for, if they don't have a faith with Jesus, I want God to become evident 
in their life. I want God to show up. I want God to do amazing things in their life that start to make them think about and understand who God might be, right? That I want God stirring their heart to seek him and that it would show up in their life and that they would notice it to prepare them. And then I pray that God would guide me to the right place and time to talk to them, right? That with eyes open, I would be willing and ready for whenever God prompts me to be ready for that conversation. I'm essentially praying that God would prepare them for that conversation and God would prepare me for that conversation. Church, prayer is really where all this begins. So you can be a pre-prayer, preparer. See what I did there? Dad jokes? Okay, we'll cut that one out. All right, so we can prepare ourselves and that God would prepare them for when we speak. All right, second condition. Be in relationship with your three. Church, part of the right conditions for a fire to spread is that it has to be in contact with things around it, right? A fire on a tiny island is not going to spread very far. If you're not in contact with your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, you're going to have limited opportunities for God to share the gospel through you. Church, sometimes I get it. I fall into a rut too, where I wake up, I get the kids ready, I take them to school, I go to work, I pick up the kids after work, I come home, I turn on the TV, I eat some food, I do some chores, save the world in my video games, hang out with my wife for a few minutes, and then I go to bed, right? And then I start again all over the next day. And I know how hard it is sometimes to prioritize relationships with other people where you share meals with them, where you hang out with them, where you spend time getting to know them and sharing life with them. Church, part of being an ambassador of God is that you spend time in the land that God sends you to. If you're an ambassador for Canada, you can't just sit in Minnesota and expect to do the job well, right? So you got to be out there. you got to be outside your home, and sometimes you got to break that comfortable routine to actually be in contact out there, developing relationships and getting to know the people God has put on your heart with your list of three. Now, church, God knows I'm not saying you have to become an extrovert because I'd be condemned if that's the case, but I think within reason, God wants you to be intentional to have relationships with people outside the church. And if you've been praying for those three people and you begin start to start spend time with them, God is going to do amazing things, church. Now, when you talk with them, this third point is to ask better questions. Ask better questions. Um, I'm looking forward to school starting this year, right? Noah's going to be in third grade. Lily's going to be in kindergarten. And um, as some of you remember, like kindergartners, when they come home from school, right, and um, you ask them, how did school go? What are they like? Right? They're like excited. And they want to tell you about what happened, sometimes in a lot of detail, right? I'm looking forward to when, like, Lily is playing on the playground, and then she went down the slide, and then she went to the monkey bars, and then Jimmy said he could run faster than me, so we raced, and then I found a dandelion, and, and you're like, did you learn anything? Right? But, you know, whatever, as long as they're talking, right? On and on. Now, if I ask Noah in third grade, how did school go? What do I get? Fine. Okay. And, and that's probably better than like five years from now when he's in eighth grade and he's just going to roll his eyes at me, right? And I won't even get a fine. But I try asking more, like, what'd you learn? I don't remember. <laughs> he's already doing this, right? It's a battle getting any amount of information out of my sons. But when I ask my son better questions, I get better responses. What was the funniest thing that happened to you today, right? Right? And then I get to hear about how he farted really loud in class. And then I'm like, okay, maybe I don't want to know <laughs> what happened in this kid's day, right? He literally told me that. <laughs> Great kid. Glad you're happy about it, right? Asking better questions helps you to get to know people better. Take, for instance, your neighbor. Hey, Jim, how are you? Right? 90% of the time, you're going to get back good, and you? Right? That's what you get for that question. And it's whether or not life is good or not. How about the weather? A little smoky lately, isn't it? Right? Yep, sure is. How's work going? Fine. 
right? We got our set of standards, safe questions that when we encounter our neighbors, our coworkers, and the people around us, we get the standard responses that just kind of say, look, I don't really want to go too deep here. I'm just trying to make small talk, right? It's a safe conversation, never going below the surface. But church, the gospel is spread best when you can speak to deeper things in life. The nature of Jesus' message is not a trite, superficial kind of thing. It's meant to change how people see the world. It's meant to change how they understand themselves. And it's meant to show us a solution to the world's problems. And church, you can only speak to the deep things of life when you actually get to the deep things of life. So learn to ask better questions. When you're done with work, weather, and the sports, get into the deeper stuff, usually by sharing about yourself and asking them about it. Say, man, I have a lot of trouble with how divided things are in this world today. How do you cope with it? Or, uh, my spouse and I have been married for 13 years. Look, it hasn't always been rainbow and butterflies. How are things really going for you at home? Or, I get so stressed with inflation and the cost of everything, it can sometimes really weigh on me. How are you hanging in there with everything going on? Right? And sometimes the really good questions are just the really open-ended ones. You ask them how work was, they're like, oh yeah, we were busy. Hey, tell me more about that. What did it look like when you were busy? Right? Just tell me more about when you ask how the family's doing. It's like, oh, the kids are just being kids. Hey, tell me more about that. Right? I get angry with my kids too. I think it's helpful to talk to another parent about these things, assuming you get angry. I'm going to assume most parents get angry. Maybe we shouldn't use angry. <laughs> right? And church, you could follow all of this up with, I'm going to pray for you this week. What can I pray for? And when you see them next, guess what, church? Ask them, hey, I've been praying for you. How is such and such going? How is this doing? Right? Church, when you genuinely care about other people and you start asking better questions in order to gain a relationship and a depth of relationship, you'll get to know them better. They'll get to know you better. And church, the right conditions will be there for you to share why faith is so important to you because you're now speaking about the deeper things in life. Let's conclude, church, and as we conclude, I'd like to invite the worship team back up because we've got a few more songs we're going to sing. Church, the gospel will not spread itself. And church, it's not someone else's job to do it. Jesus wants all of us to be connected with the people around us, our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends. And like a fire, he wants the gospel to spread. And it spreads best when your life is on fire for God, when you show a transformed life. And when you start praying for specific people around you and building relationships with them and asking better questions to get to know them, and if you do these things, then sharing the gospel, church, I promise, is not as hard or scary as what you think it might be. Because really, what you're doing is just sharing your life with other people who you care about, sharing the thing that brings you joy and peace in this world. And church, when we do these things, it pleases God. As we live in as ambassadors on this earth, sharing the gospel in our deeds and in word with those around us, to call others back to God so that they can be reconciled to him. As 2 Corinthians says, if we're going to be here on this earth, and if we still have to be in our groaning, old, aging bodies ruined by sin, then let's make the most of it while we're here. As we wait for that glorious future, let's get to work being ambassadors for Jesus, inviting others to know him, connecting them to a growing relationship with Jesus, spreading the fire of the gospel. That's what this short series was all about. We're not trying to fill our church or get more money or get more volunteers to help take care of the kids, right? This series is reminding us our most important task, to share the gospel of Jesus with those who don't know it, to pray, to get to know them, and to follow God's desire for helping them find Jesus, just as we have. I want to remind you, 
on September 10th for our fall kickoff, we'd love for you to invite a friend or one of your three that you've been praying for. Let's pray. Father, as we focus on your mission to this world and how you entrusted it to Jesus' followers, Father, I pray that you would just guide our steps, turn up the flame in our life, make us on fire for you to set the right conditions for this gospel to spread. Father, that we would be a people here at Branchline who you use to bring others to know you. Father, we just pray that you would give us the right words and show us the right relationships to develop and help us to ask the right questions so that we can know and love our neighbors and show them you. And Jesus, I pray as we go from this place that you would just be keeping it on our hearts to pray, to seek you, and to love on our neighbors. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.